Hello, welcome to Lesson 28 of our studies in denominational doctrines. Now what we've been trying to do, we've been trying to show you what men say, show you what the Bible says, and show you that the Bible is right. We have been studying about the church and the glory thereof, that is the true New Testament church, and contrast that with the ungodliness that's involved in denominationalism. We say that kindly. But men have parted, uh, departed from the teachings of the Bible, established man-made churches, and exalt them rather than going back to the teachings of the New Testament. And we're trying to get you to go back to the teachings of the New Testament. You know, we've shown in days gone by how that the church and the kingdom are one in the same institution. We have shown you how Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he turned right around and said to Peter, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. So the church and the kingdom are one and the same institution. But what's amazing is this. Men, those who are supposed to be learned, preachers, those who claim they study this book, say that God Almighty in the Old Testament saw the kingdom, the prophets saw the kingdom, but the church is not mentioned therein. So Jesus Christ comes on the scene in the first century along with John the Baptist and others trying to establish the kingdom, but what God did not know, what Christ did not know, what the Holy Spirit did not know, was that the Jews were going to reject the Christ. Therefore, the establishment of the kingdom had to be put off. And the church was an accident, really. Never planned. God never saw it. He, you might say, used this kind of as a spare tire to fill in until he could get his will done a little later. Now, friends, any doctrine that reflects upon the knowledge of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit in that fashion has got to be a false doctrine, to say the least. To say that God did not know what the future held, and here's God making prophecies that according to them did not come to pass. Why, I can't imagine man being so bold as to try to promote his theories over the teachings of the Word of God, and then take the church and relegate it to a matter of just being an accident, an afterthought, or whatever. Oh, friends, let me tell you, the church of our Lord is great, it's glorious. The kingdom is great and glorious. It's one and the same beautiful institution. And though we have those today in the religious world that say the kingdom has not been established, we're going to show you today that indeed it has. See, there's a false doctrine out there relative to final things that says the kingdom has not been established. But we're going to read you verse after verse after verse that will establish that the king kingdom indeed is here. First of all, notice it was to come within the time frame of the four world empire, empires in Daniel chapter 2. Now, when you read Daniel chapter 2, notice what it says. Those empires have come and gone, and Daniel 2 makes that declaration that they were going to come. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now notice then, Daniel saw a kingdom that was coming that wouldn't be like these four world empires, but this kingdom would st stand forever. But this kingdom was to come during those four empires. Those four empires have come and gone, the last of which is the Roman Empire. Now when you read books like The, L the Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey or some of these other men, one thing they try to do is within the pages of those books is to declare the Roman Empire will be reestablished. Well, why did they feel the need of reestablishing 
the Roman Empire because they don't want this prophecy to be wrong. See, the Lord saw four world empires in Daniel chapter 2. And during the reign of those four world empires, the eternal, everlasting kingdom of our loving Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was to be established. But as mentioned a moment ago, those four empires have come and gone. Now listen, if the kingdom of our Lord has not been established, it never will. Because those kingdoms have come and gone. And the prophecy will be false if the kingdom has not been established. But it has been established. We have already given you some proof and lessons gone by. We'll give you more proof today. Listen, if the Lord said he was going to establish a kingdom, and he sent his son here to do that, and his son couldn't get the job done the first time, I have no confidence he's going to do any better the second time. What makes you believe that he can do any better the second time? So notice then the kingdom was to be established within the time frame of those four world empires. Point two, Christ is the high priest now. And he is to be priest and king at the same time. Now here's the point. If Christ is a priest now, according to what I'm going to read to you in just a moment from Zechariah, he's got to be a king now. And if he's a king now, he's got to have a kingdom. I ask people who call the radio program and deny that the kingdom is here. I say, well, is Jesus Christ king of kings and lord of lords right now? You see, they can't deal with that. If they say he's king of kings and lord of lords right now, then where is his kingdom? I want to know where his kingdom is if he is indeed a king. In Zechariah 6, beginning with verse number 12, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. Now watch this. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. Notice he's going to be a priest upon his throne. While he's on the throne, he's going to be a priest. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Both what? Being king and priest at the same time. Now, friends, everybody I know of religiously that believes in Christianity, they declare that Jesus Christ certainly is a priest right now. Well, if he's a priest right now, according to Zechariah, he's a king right now. And if he's a king right now, he's got to have a kingdom. Where in the world is that kingdom? Well, he's got his kingdom, and I'm a citizen in that kingdom. And you can be a citizen in that kingdom as well if you'll simply do what the Bible says. Well, number three, notice this. Many who lived in the time of Christ were not to die until they had seen the kingdom. Mark 9, 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of you that stand here which shall not taste of death till ye have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, we'll read that verse on radio, and we'll tell people who deny the kingdom is here. Please call in and tell us whether or not Jesus was right in Mark 9, 1. Jesus said that many in the first century standing right there with him would not taste of death. They would not die until they saw the kingdom of God come with power. Now, if Jesus told the truth, then the kingdom came within their lifetime. Or else, we got some mighty old people around here somewhere, folks. Now, can you imagine seeing somebody almost 2,000 years old? Because Jesus Christ said they would not die until they saw the kingdom of God come with power. We have begged preachers, call in and tell us if Jesus Christ was right. If he is right, the kingdom is here. Well, I guarantee you he's right. The kingdom is here. The preachers are wrong who say the kingdom is not here. 
Then in the fourth place, when one is born again, I want you to notice he enters the kingdom. Now, if the kingdom's not here, folks, you can't teach the new birth. Because when someone is born again, that individual is added to the kingdom. In John 3, beginning with verse number 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, speaking to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice when you're born again, what happens to you? You enter into the kingdom of God. Well, if the kingdom's not here, you can't preach the new birth. Because if someone should comply to the things that are essential to being born again, and if one were born again, then he'd have to be placed into the kingdom of God. Now watch this. Is it not amazing that when you're born again, you're placed into the kingdom? But the Bible says when you're saved, Acts 2, you're added to the church. Acts 2, 47. Showing that being saved and being born again are one and the same thing, and that being in the kingdom and being in the church is one and the same thing. So friends, thanks be to God. The kingdom is here. I can be born again and be a citizen in that glorious kingdom where Jesus Christ rules as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's my king right now, and he can be yours too if you'll be born again according to the teachings of the Bible. Then in the fifth place, I want you to notice, the people at Colossae were translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now, you tell me how in the world the people at Colossae, upon obeying the gospel of Christ, could be placed into a kingdom that did not even exist? Well, common sense would tell you that would be an impossibility. If they're going to be placed into the kingdom, the kingdom's got to be there. Well, prove they were in the kingdom, all right? Colossians 1.13 who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Notice the kingdom belongs to the Son. If the kingdom belongs to the Son, he's a king. And if he's a king, he's king of kings. He is Lord of lords. And he did just exactly what he said he came to do. You know, he preached it was here. We'll see that in a moment. And so here... The people at Colossae, now notice, they were taken out of the world and placed into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Next, John was in the kingdom. You know what amazes me again? People will go to the book of Revelation, a book that they really, for the most part, don't understand. And they'll look at that highly figurative language, and they'll try to interpret the rest of the Bible by highly figurative language, and then they don't even believe that which can be clearly understood in the book of Revelation. For instance, in the book of Revelation, the writer John declares that he's in the kingdom. But denominational preachers go to the book of Revelation to try to teach the kingdom is not here. Now you're talking about a contradiction. John says, I'm in the kingdom. He's going this direction. And denominational preacher says, they, they'll say, no, I'm going to use the book of Revelation to show the kingdom has not been established. So you got John and denominational preachers crossed up. Now, either you've got to believe John, or you've got to believe these denominational preachers teaching the creeds and the doctrines of men. Well, let me read to you what John said. He said, in John, uh, Revelation, rather, 1, 9, I, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom. Notice he is in the kingdom. He so declares. And even though he declares that, the preachers won't believe it. But that doesn't shock me. Jesus says, he that believeth in his baptized shall be saved. They don't believe that either. Jesus said that eternal life is in the world to come. According to Mark 10, 30, many of them don't even believe that. And so then they call to question and into question that which inspired men have stated. 
Well, notice the Lord's Supper was to be observed in the kingdom. But those in the church in the first century were partakers of the Lord's Supper, showing that the kingdom and the church are one and the same. Thus, the kingdom has been established. In Luke 22, 17 and 18, And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now here's an interesting thought. Let's look at this as the time frame in which the old earth is going to remain since the establishment of the church over here. Do you know the Lord's Supper can only be taken till he come? Do this in remembrance of me till I come. So the Lord's Supper has got to be taken before the second coming of Christ. If the Lord's Supper is to be taken before the second coming of Christ, and it's going to be done in the kingdom, then the kingdom has to be established before the second coming of Christ. That's easy enough to understand. But then let me show you what happens here according to the reading of 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 23, beginning. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, now watch, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, Luke 22 said that the Lord's Supper was going to be in the kingdom. But 1 Corinthians 11 shows that they were partaking of the Lord's Supper in the Lord's church. Same way with Acts 20, verse number 7. So then, the church and the kingdom are one and the same institution. Therefore, the kingdom has been established. Then notice, Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter. But if he did not use those keys, then he will never get to use them because he was to use the keys that were given to him and open the doors to the Lord's church and so forth by the teachings so that men could obey the inspired teachings and thus become children of God. Listen to what the Word of God says. And he said, Go into the city to, uh, uh, to such a man and say to him, The Master saith, My time is at hand. Now if the Lord's time was at hand, that he was to leave, and he was to do all that the Bible said he was going to do, and one thing that he was going to do was to establish the kingdom, then, my friends, if he did not do that, he was not a success. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples, and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. So the time was at hand. And so it had to be done in the lifetime of Jesus Christ and Peter and those who lived in the first century. See, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Was he serious? The other disciples taught that, as we shall see in a moment. Jesus gave Peter the keys. Jesus said, the time for my being offered is at hand. Well, offered for what? He was going to die for the church. The church and the kingdom are one and the same institution. Notice then John the Baptist taught that the kingdom of heaven was at hand as well. Now, if this was not the case, then John the Baptist was a false teacher. In Matthew 3, verse number 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, a moment ago, we noticed the time of Christ's departure. His death was at hand. But during that time, and before that time, Jesus taught the kingdom was at hand. Now, He's fixing to die. Is he going to die without accomplishing the things he came here to do? John is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did he teach the truth? Now can you imagine John preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then 
He's put to death, and he winds up being a false teacher according to the denominational preachers because the kingdom really wasn't at hand anyway. According to them, he died nearly 2,000 years ago, and the kingdom is still not here. Why, you know better than that. I know better than that. God gave you a good mind, and he gave you a Bible. And you are to believe what's in the Bible and not what comes from the lips of some inspired man. Well, notice Jesus taught that the kingdom of heaven was at hand as well. And if this is not the case, then he was a false teacher. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice, Jesus took up the same preaching that John had been doing and declared the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, was he right or was he wrong? Now, if these denominational preachers are right, Jesus was wrong. Because, you see, the Lord honestly, sincerely thought that he was going to establish the kingdom, but he did not realize the Jews were going to reject him. God did not realize that. So God and Christ and the Holy Spirit had to do the second best thing by putting the kingdom off and allowing Jesus to die for the church. What a reflection upon the Godhead, friends. A false doctrine that reflects upon the Godhead like that is ridiculous. Any false doctrine is ridiculous to start with. But one that just slaps God right in the face. And then to think that people will pick up on that and believe it. Then notice that the disciples taught the kingdom of heaven was at hand. If this was not so, then they too were false teachers. In Matthew 10, 7, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so they taught it. Jesus taught it. John the Baptist taught it. And what they all did not realize was, it was all a falsehood. No, it wasn't a falsehood. It was the truth. There are some false teachers here, all right. But it's the denominational preachers that declare the kingdom has not been established. Then the ten virgins, in Matthew chapter 25, were in the kingdom before the second coming. In Matthew 25, 1 through 13, we read of this parable. But then notice what it says. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. They're going forth trying to stay prepared to meet the bridegroom when he comes back for the second time. Five of them continued to remain prepared and five failed to do that and thus they were shut out because they failed to continue to be prepared. But notice they were in the kingdom prior to the second coming. Then next, number 13, the man with one talent was in the kingdom before his master returned. When one reads Matthew 25, beginning with verse number 14 and following, you read of this very important story. And it says this in verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now notice before the master left, he distributed the goods. Now this man is said to be in the kingdom. And then notice the master returns. And then the master wants the man with one talent as well as the others to give an account for what they've done with their several abilities. And so then this man was unprepared. And it cost him his soul. Then number 14, the gospel that we preach is the gospel of the kingdom. According to Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Notice this, my friends, is the gospel of the kingdom. By the way, when you read about Philip and other inspired men, in the first century, members of the body of Christ, they would go forth preaching the things pertaining to the kingdom of heaven. Why preach it if it's not here? Are they going to wind up looking real bad like John the Baptist and Jesus and the other disciples who taught it was here are soon to be here at hand and it never showed up? 
No, the kingdom was established just like the Bible declares. Then notice this statement about Philip in Acts 8, verse number 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Notice he preached the things concerning Jesus and the kingdom of God. That's what I preach. I preach things about Jesus and the kingdom of God. And I show that people need to be born again to be placed into that kingdom. Where Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Then, number 16, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, according to the Bible, in Revelation 19, 16. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Like I mentioned a moment ago, I asked people, is Jesus a king now? Well, he'll be a king. No. I want to know, is he a king now? Well, he was born to be a king, and one day he's going to be it. No. Is he a king right now? Yes, he's a king right now. Then I want you to notice in the 17th place, the, the will be separated, the, the bad will be separated from the good when the Lord comes back. And this is out of his kingdom. Notice Matthew 13, beginning with verse number 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore, and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. Now notice, the good is separated from the bad. What good? Those that were in the kingdom of heaven, according to Matthew 13, beginning with verse number 47. So when the Lord returns, those that are in the kingdom even, will be separated according to the lifestyle that they lived. Then I want you to notice that Jesus will deliver the kingdom back to the Father when he returns. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom uh, to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, authority, and power. So we see again, according to the teachings of the Bible here, that the kingdom is going to be delivered back to the Father. Notice he's coming back to divide from within the kingdom the good from the bad. Then he's going to deliver the kingdom back to the Father. There's not a verse in God's word that says he's going to ever set foot back upon this earth to establish a kingdom that he couldn't establish, according to the premillennial people, when he came here the first time. Well, like I said a moment ago, if he couldn't do it the first time, I have no confidence in him that he can do any better the second time. But the truth of the matter is, he got the job done the first time. You see, the Lord's not a liar. He said the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and he told the truth. He said some of you standing here will not die until you see the kingdom of God come with power. He told the truth. He said if a person's born again, they enter the kingdom. He told the truth. Well, then who's telling the falsehoods? These preachers that say that is not the truth which our Lord declared. Then notice, the kingdom of our Lord is not a kingdom of this world. In John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So notice, the Lord made it plain, my kingdom's not of this world. You know, one reason the Jews missed the Savior, they were looking for an earthly kingdom. They wanted someone who would come and be their king and deliver them out from under the Roman government. Because they were looking for a worldly kingdom, they missed the Messiah. They missed Jesus. They missed salvation. Now, many today are looking for an earthly kingdom. Now, when they start looking for this kingdom, they come up with a system that makes God a liar, makes Christ a liar, it makes the Holy Spirit a liar, it makes the Bible a book full of falsehoods, all those prophecies concerning the kingdom, they're all false, they had to be put off, the Lord couldn't even do what he said he was going to do. Are you going to put trust in a theory like that? It's not just a theory, 
it is a false doctrine that will damn the souls of men. And you and I got to love people enough to let them know this. Notice then in the parable of the sower, the good seed brings forth the children of the kingdom. Well, we know what the good seed is. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. But notice what it says. The world is the field. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So the good seed has been produced by the word of God. They're the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Then notice if we look at all the parables, we've understood them and everybody else has understood them for years to refer to the church. But many of them start out by saying the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. Well, how in the world can we take parables that apply to the kingdom and apply them to the church if the church and the kingdom are not one and the same institution? Well, they are one and the same institution. So it's all right to take the parables that refer to the kingdom of heaven and apply them to the New Testament church. Then as we think about what a kingdom is, a kingdom is pri comprised of a king, a law, a territory, subjects. And when you think about a spiritual kingdom and the one that the Lord has, he's the king, according to Revelation 19.16. He has a law. We read about preaching the law or the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14. He has a territory. Go ye therefore into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature, Matthew 16 or Mark 16, 15. And then he has subjects. These are they that have been born again, John 3, 3 through 5. We noticed that those who are born again are placed into the kingdom. They enter the kingdom. They are translated from the world or from darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, according to Colossians 1.13. So then, all of these statements are true when we think about the Lord's kingdom as well. He's a king. He's got a law. He's got a territory. He has subjects. Then notice the Bible says that we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. How in the world can you and I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness if the kingdom is not here? Well, the kingdom has been established. Then the brethren of the first century received a kingdom that could not be moved. According to Hebrews 12 and verse number 28, Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So the Hebrew writer said, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. What's the difference in that and the prophecy made about the kingdom? In Daniel 2.44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdom, kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, in Hebrews, they had a kingdom being established that could not be moved. In Daniel, we see a prophecy made of a kingdom that would be established that could not be destroyed. It's an everlasting kingdom. So we see these are one and the same kingdoms. Then in the 25th place, all of the identifying marks and characteristics of the kingdom found in Isaiah 2 and Daniel 2 and other prophecies are found and fulfilled in the Lord's church that was established, Acts chapter 2. So again, we know the church and the kingdom to be one and the same institution. The judgment follows death and not the establishment of the kingdom. Notice what the Bible says. It says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the establishment of the kingdom. No. After this, the judgment. Notice then, the judgment follows death. Not the Lord coming back to this earth 
to try to fix up what the premillennial people said he goofed up when he was here the first time. No, he didn't goof it up. He did exactly what the Father prophesied would occur. When he said the kingdom of heaven was at hand, he meant it. And it came to pass when he said those standing there wouldn't taste of death until they saw the kingdom of God come with power, he meant it. And that came to pass. Well, I read to you in a lesson prior to this one about 1 Chronicles 17, beginning with verse number 11, where Nathan made a prophecy that when David had died and gone to be with his fathers, that God would raise up one of his loins, his seed, to sit upon his throne. He would give to him a kingdom, and he would rule forever, and this kingdom would not be taken away from him. But do you realize, my friends, that in Acts chapter 2, the inspired man Peter, starting with verse number 29, going through verse number 34, takes that same prophecy and says, this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, either Peter was right or he was wrong. Well, I'm here to tell you Peter was right. He was moved to speak by the Holy Spirit. He could not have made mistakes. But then again, neither could Jesus. But the premillennial people want you to believe that somehow he did. He thought he could establish the kingdom. He was honest in that. He was just honestly confused. John the Baptist really thought Jesus was going to establish the kingdom, but John too was just honestly confused. The disciples all thought he was going to establish that kingdom, but they too were honestly confused. Now I'll tell you who's confused. These preachers who deny what's found in the Word of God. I've given you proof after proof after proof to establish the kingdom has been established. You know the beautiful thing about it? You and I in love and kindness can go forth, preach the true plan of salvation. How that one is to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized for the remission of their sins. We can assist them in disobedience, and they come forth to walk in newness of life. But the beautiful thing about it, the Bible says, when one is born of water and of the Spirit, he enters into the kingdom of God. John 3, 3 through 5, he's taken out of the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And these preachers can declare from now to Jesus comes back that the kingdom is not here, but the Lord says it is. And Jesus Christ is King of kings. He's Lord of lords right now. Make him your king and your Lord. Well, we appreciate you being with us. And may God richly bless you as you continue to study the greatest of all books, the inspired, inerrant, perfect will of God.